this. Okay, there we go. You guys say hi. There you go. Everybody over there said hi. hi. Come on, guys. Hi. Eric Fisher. Hi. He's smiling at least. <laughs> you just did. Got him. Oh. <laughs> That was too easy. Okay. Jedi mind trick right there. Um, now, uh, I should probably put this over there because, well, you're just going to have to listen, you guys. No, not a movie. Although I would like to watch a movie with you guys before the end of the year. That'd be fun. It would have to relate, though. VR? Gooping off? I don't know what you're saying. All right, so here we are. Do um, you guys remember watching the video? Yes. Oh, yeah, I remember. Um, <laughs> you remember watching it? Um, so you guys had to write down. You guys, it's a list of things that you wrote down. You were supposed to write down practical things about the video. And sadly, your disadvantage. Oh, here it is. It's like a caramel. So get get out that seven words for sin piece of paper. Uh, nice. Not oh, here. It is. No, that's good. No. You guys, this isn't good for you. This is not a good thing. What? Why? Why do I do this myself? Yeah. Here's the list. All right. So you guys, you were required last time to write down several important ideas, practical things about the video. Um, so before I address the notes over here on the board, I want to go around to each table and have you guys tell me what you learned. Again, the video has nothing to do with Christianity, but it has everything to do with Christianity. Paying attention. Yes. Quinn, you're going to go first. That's the best answer. Um, I think a lot to Christianity because um, the way they related it to like, one the video they were talking about how he was. Um, Just give me one thing, one practical thing, because I want to let other tables do yeah, it too. Like, okay. And let's um, see if it lines up with my list. Like, that he was using ancient methods. He was relearning ancient methods. Yes. Because they were more, um, like, they were better methods. Yeah. And I think that relates to Christianity because in history, people, like, in more ancient times, I think Christians were more. Like devoted to God. Yeah, okay, so that's number one on my list. And if it's not on your list, this is where you need to update your list. Yeah, there you go, Quinn. Look at that. I put down, and you can put down what he said, ancient methods, because I think they use that word as well, or forgotten historical methods. That's what ought to be written down. All right? So no Chromebook. You guys should have paper out. Let's get rolling there. You should check it out on Classroom. It's all there. Yeah. It's all there. In class. I, I explain everything on there. Yeah. So forgotten historical method, we would call that in our language, the scripture, right? Again, it has nothing to do with Christianity, but everything you guys, um, I fear are at a great disadvantage. Um, and like America pediatrics, people who write journals about where kids are at specifically psychologically today are very, very concerned because of this date here. And this is something you probably should write down. What happened on this date here? Anybody know? Yes. Now, the, the iPhone dropped, um, and it, we basically didn't have any laws about usage of iPhone or what companies could do about that. Um, and I highly recommend checking this out yourself. This is what the smartest psychologists, doctors, PhDs are saying about this. Um, 
they they're starting to equate this and i mentioned this earlier with uh child labor laws that had to be created you guys realize at one point people just used kids to get a lot of money right you know that's a thing no one even challenged it the big businesses wanted money so what do they do exploit the kids they're saying the same thing's happening here who wants the money big businesses and who are exploited as a result, the kids. And so child labor laws had to be enacted in order for the, not, not just for the preservation of you individually, but for the preservation of society. Like America would have been screwed if they didn't have child labor laws because that next generation would have been so abused. Well, they were, and it was, it was a sad thing. That's why they need the laws. Now what they're starting to say is, what kind of laws do we need for this? And the, the honest, genuine question is, what is the appropriate age for this? I don't know if you know this, like nationwide, schools are really asking this question. Should phones even be allowed to be at school at, at the high school level? Because if you talk to any cop, go do it. I just had a conversation with one a couple of weeks ago. 90% of the problems they deal with are surrounding what do you think? Phones. 90%. And all the cops are saying, we wish we could just get rid of them. Or they're saying, uh, we, we wish that the heads of schools or principals had enough courage to simply say, no phones on campus, phone-free campus, starting to write their own laws. Now, again, you might see in the next five to 10 years, because we don't usually ask these questions before it's too late, um, you will start to see some of this enacted. Because the smartest people out there, America Pediatrics, and you can read the journal articles if you care to, um, are saying we need to really question this. Um, so, so all that to say, um, you guys are being raised not with historical methods about how to live your life. You guys are being raised with questions that nobody is asking just to give the big businesses a good, healthy paycheck. Now, that's really sad. So the historical methods we find in scripture give you guys something way better to do with your lives. Read, again, read Matthew 5, 6, and 7. If you're confused about what to do with your life, don't turn here. If you're confused about what to do with your life, open up the scriptures and say, what should I do, God? The God who created me, the God of this universe. Because if you go against the grain of the God of this universe, the God who created you, that's going to hurt your life overall. Um, okay, so that's a, that's a great first one, forgotten historical methods, ancient practices, go back to the scripture. And one thing you probably should also add to your note there, they used really mysterious language, and I know it's a silly video, and I'm not trying to get too much out of it, but it said the old manuscripts told him what to do. They had like this speaking authority over this archer's life. The scripture says the very same thing that God's word has the power to speak to you if you allow it. Um, okay, let's move on to another table. So we'll go this way. What did you guys get from the video? A practical thing. See if it's on my list. Both of you give me one just to see if it's on my list. So he put, he like put in the practice so he wouldn't miss the target. Okay, that's uh, number five on my list. Good job, Kaylee. Um, practice, put it into practice. And what you should write down is it's not practice that makes perfect. What is it? Perfect practice makes perfect. If you get really good, because you're practicing it all the time, missing the mark, that's what you're going to be good at. You're only ever going to get good at what you're practicing the most. Okay, So it's perfect practice makes perfect. That's why Christ would say, be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. That's your target. Who is God? That's your target. Uh, get good at practicing that. And it will create skills based on this one in a previous class. Someone said this will allow you to be a Christian in motion. I like that. You should write that down. I wrote it down. A Christian in motion is one who is practicing what they're learning, not just letting it go in one ear, out the other, or worse, in one ear, and you really know it well. Pharisee or Satan knows the information well, but it's in one ear. You know it, and you actually apply it, all right? Practicing the skill. Emphasis on the gerund there, practicing. Okay, let's do another. What's the next? Oh, you weren't here, so it's on you, Austin. Um, well, they said that 
I already kind of was missing the target, but could you say like if you continue to miss a target, you'll miss out, like, or no? Um, I don't have that one on my list. No, I don't know. Like, oh man, God. What? I don't know. Like, Bummer. it's just this must feel bad. <laughs> You're trying, it's okay. We can go to another table. Maybe Vanessa knows. Yes. Okay. Let's stop there. That's a really good one. What? What? You know, that's what people always say after they miss the mark. Um, okay. So, in other words, what they said, and you should write this down: unlearn everything you've learned. That's what you were saying. In other words, unlearn everything you've learned. And what is a good New Testament word that describes that? I want to see if you guys are tracking here. Jesus used it. J the B used it. It's a wonderful word that pastors use all the time, and it describes this exactly. Unlearn everything you've learned. What is that? Oh, come on. Don't be the only class that can't answer that one. Crickets are beating you guys. What is it? Unlearn everything you learn. It's very gospel driven. Jesus told his disciples to do this, and it's one word. John the Baptist told the Pharisees to do it because they weren't doing it. Who said it? Khalid. Let's go. Okay, I might let you win tonight now. That's so fantastic. You did such a good job. Repent. So put that. What? Okay, I'll be ruthless. Okay. Um, okay, so unlearn what we what you have learned. Um, and that's hard, and I get it, it's so hard for you guys, but that's where God's grace and his mercy comes in every single day because you've grown up with something that no one is checking and no one's challenging, and it's going to be hard to step outside of the rut that you're used to, but that's where grace comes in. It's not like when you fall, God's like, sucks for you, that was your one chance, never again. I mean, could you imagine a parent who loves their kid, like when all three of my kids were learning how to walk? Um, and they fell. It's not like I showed up and said, you stupid idiot, what are you doing? No, I'm like, I got down on my knees, I picked them up, I said, let's try again. That's what grace looks like when we don't know what to do. And God will help you if you lean into his grace. Yes, Quinn. That's part of repentance, certainly. Because do you have to do that here? I have to admit this is wrong. Changing and doing something about it, and and also, if you unlearn everything you've learned, you're you're doing a 180 and going the opposite direction. That's what repentance is. So it's all of that. Excellent, um, good recall there. Okay, so a great one, Vanessa. Thank you. Um, next table here. Were you guys? You guys were here? No, Kaylee, you were here. No, it wasn't. He's just going to hope that he can write a good thing, good something down, right? Yeah. Okay. Oh, goodness gracious. You have nothing written down? No, I do. Oh, give me something then. Not necessarily in. I have to. Just give us something practical that you saw here that we haven't discussed yet. That's all. And then we'll see how we can relate it to Christianity. Oh, please. I like. Oh, I like a Wait, you can share your experience with Oh, okay. I think that kind of goes into practicing in the skills. That's one of the skill sets that he has, and that's a great application for it, actually. I like that. Um, did anybody write down, well, actually, I have a couple more tables. Elizabeth, were you here? What did you write down? Okay, let's see. I think that goes under the practicing bit as well. Um, but it relates to my number six. Hitting the target is essential because it saves lives. What you just said there about helping other people. So make sure you have that one. Um, 
hitting the target is essential. If you are practicing something other than the way of Christ, and again, this is only for people who call themselves Christians, so I'm not trying to step on anybody's toes here. But if you are if you're calling yourself a Christian and you're doing something other than the way of Christ, you're actually doing damage to the people that you call friends. And you're doing damage to people outside of your friend circles as well. Um, so hitting the target is essential for saving lives. That's, that is a good one. Thanks, Elizabeth. Okay, last table over here. Khalid, you weren't here. Is that what you said, or were you here? But were both of you guys here? Oh, what? Saved by the bell. <laughs> I don't know. Go check it out and then come back if you have to. Um, Yosia, what do you got? Oh, you weren't you weren't here. You don't have anything. Okay, so well, are you guys tapped? Should I give you the rest of my list, or do you guys have any others that you that you wrote down that you want to say? Sounds like we're tapped. Did anything have to do with like he was talking about in the movie how uh, he would, like split an arrow, so then he tried to do that like in the air and that like breaking his Oh, yeah. So Sierra actually mentioned that in period three. That's a good one. Uh, breaking the standard. So supposedly the best an archer could do was split an arrow that was already pinned on the target. And so Sierra was like, yeah, that's the Pharisees' best attempt at completing the law. But then Jesus shows up and the enemy's arrow is coming at him and he just destroys it, splits it down the middle as it's shot at him. So that, that's another good one. What's up? You're leaving? Okay, well, we'll see you later, Cleve. Okay, a couple more that you need to write down. Um, only three more. Write down the Hollywood myth. Why do you think that one's important? The Hollywood myth. We saw Katniss, Arrow, Legolas, you could probably add, and Robin Hood. We saw those four. Why is the Hollywood myth something to watch out for? False teachings. And what else? Fake. fake. Write those two things down. Those are, that's perfect. It's false and it's fake. Now, what's sad, oftentimes, people are enamored by the celebrity pastors that exist out there. And the celebrity pastors, I'm talking about pastors of like mega churches. And, and this, we're, we're really seeing the fruit of that, especially in the last 10 years, of these mega churches that have existed in America. Be careful of the celebrity pastor approach. It's one thing to go to the theater and enjoy Katniss or Legolas, but do you actually have a relationship with them? No. And if you're wanting to become an archer, you're not going to really learn anything well from them because they're doing it the wrong way. Now think about your own relationship. And now this is something internal. I'm not asking you to answer this out loud. What does your relationship with your pastor look like? Do you have a relationship with your pastor? If not, that should concern you to a great degree. The way that the early church was set up is that there, do you, do you even know what a pastor means? A pastor is somebody who is guiding you and leading you, not just showing up once a week and giving a message that you listen to, but someone that is investing in your life and helping you out. That's what a pastor is. So watch out for the Hollywood myth. Hopefully that's busted up in your life to a certain degree. Um, okay, another one you should write down uh, is it took this guy a long time to figure it out. And he was okay with making mistakes. It took him 10 years to be able to produce a, a video like this. Again, it goes back to the example I already gave. God doesn't show up to cast a lightning bolt at you when you fall and fail. He doesn't. At least that's not my experience with God. When I make a mistake, God shows up time and time again as a gracious, loving father who picks me up and restores me. That's the picture we get in scripture. So when we miss the mark, God isn't there ready to destroy us. That's not how God functions. And it takes time. How did the disciples do after spending three years with the very God incarnate in the flesh? How did the disciples do? They failed miserably. Remember, the, the shepherd was struck and the sheep scattered. They didn't even show up and, and defend in their mind what they thought they were supposed to defend. The best Peter could do is, Jesus says, love your enemy. 
And Peter says like this, picks up a sword and tries to cut off someone's head and misses their head and hits their ear. Jesus is like, no, not like that. And he restores the ear. He doesn't even yell at Peter. And so there's grace even in the moments that we make some pretty stupid decisions. Uh, that's how much God loves us and that's how great his mercy is. And the last one, this is probably in my mind the most important one. And as it relates to a conversation about sin, it's often missed. There ought to be a joyful response. And so it says here in the video that he was having fun doing this. The 10 years that he was investing in his life, I don't know why this guy has such a passion with archery, but he enjoyed it thoroughly. God has created you to enjoy thoroughly following the boundaries that he has set for your life. If there is no joy in following the boundaries that Christ has set in your life, you should check whether or not you have really started to unlearn everything you've learned. Because there will be tension. The, the scriptures even says sin is pleasurable for a season. It goes out of its way to tell you that you will enjoy sin. So think about it. Sin's actually really fun for a moment. But then it, it, it's, like a, it's like this lion that seeks you and prowls around you and just is waiting to destroy you. It ends in destruction, but boy, it feels good in the moment. But there is pleasure and joy in repentance, unlearning everything you've learned. And you will, I can guarantee you, it's just personal experience, other people I've seen, will have fun walking with Christ. Um, okay, so that's the list here. Now, we don't do this. I'm going to walk over to your note cards now. We, we don't, ought not to do this ever by ourselves. But let me ask this basic question. In your, and maybe it's different in your experience, I'm only leaning on my experience, so maybe it is different in yours. In your experience, how does your, how do your churches teach you how to deal with sin? What are you supposed to do with sin? You tell me, what is your church experience? When you sin, what do your pastors tell you to do? Okay, repent to who? God. Okay, so usually, past, and this is because it's a Protestant tradition, um, you are supposed to confess your sins to God. So you're, the best you can do, because this is what you heard growing up, is confess sin to God. Now, I am not discouraging this at all. The scriptures even say to do this, all right? And we'll see that, hopefully, we get to the text next week when, I, when we read 1 John together. The, the text clearly tells us to do that. You are supposed to. So good on your pastors for telling you to confess your sin. What's, what do you think would be a, a step up of confessing your sin to God? Yes. Totally changing should be part of it, and this next step actually encourages that change to take place. No? Yes, confessing to God, asking for forgiveness is part of it, recognizing you are the one at fault. What else? David? Yes. Talking to talking to a real human being. Like now, again, I'm not trying to, oh my goodness, I'm not trying to limit God at all. First and foremost, you confess your sin to God. That is amazing. But there's another word here. Community. You ought to confess sin, sin to who? To people, one another. This is what James says, the brother of Jesus. Confess your sin to one another. Why? Now, again, I'm not trying to limit God. Sometimes in these conversations with students, like, it's good enough to confess to God. I only ever need to confess to God. Guess what? You're not being bible enough. You could, you could actually do much better in your relationship with God and other people. Which is easier to do? This one is so much easier to do. Why is it easier to do that? He already knows. Oh, totally. So one of the greatest reasons why people don't do this, fear, the scriptures call it fear of man. Um, you can call it person of people. Fear of a person. 
You're just afraid about what they might think. Which leads to shame. This is the wheelhouse of the enemy. Fear of man and shame. The enemy will do everything in its power to get you to not confess your sins to one another. Because it's hard to look somebody in the eye and say, this is how I specifically messed up. Do you guys have, again, this is an internal question, you can answer that loud. Do you have somebody in your life that you can look them in the eye and say, this is how my week really went. I've messed up here, 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 here. Can you pray for me? If you, it, again, I say this graciously, if you don't have somebody like that in your life, it's going to be a lot harder for you to, to be joyful. It really will be. But if you have this one another aspect where you can confess your sins to each other, I have buddies that I get to talk to sometimes on a weekly or a monthly basis, and they check in with me. They say, how is it going with this? And they specifically ask me those pointed questions. And they, they say, tell me, because last time you told me you messed up here, so tell me how you're doing now. And that's a, that's a friend. That's somebody who is interested in my life. That's somebody who cares about what's going on. If you don't have that, please let somebody know. Let your pastors know. Go to a youth group. Find, find it. Find that community somewhere where you can actually deal with it. This is where I think there's true growth, personally. Um, and that's why we're represented in here. It's like you're not in it alone. All these ways in which we sin, you're never in this alone. The enemy wants you to think you're alone. Yeah? And the, the joy of confessing your sin to one another is you realize, oh, they, they struggle with this too. They mess up in the same way too. I'm not the only one that struggles with this. Let's carry each other's burdens together. Are you guys tracking with that? Does that make sense? Please find somebody that, that you can do that with, um, and it will, it will be to your advantage. Okay, um, so I want to put this uh, quote up here. This is what sin is. You should, you should write this quote down. But I want to ask you the question. Obviously, the unit that we're in, what is the unit called? Starts with an H. Come on, guys. Hamartiology. And this quote relates to another unit that we studied, and I put it in bold that you can barely see. What's that other unit that this is recalling? Not anthropology, although, what? Theology proper. Perfect. Theology proper. The holy character of God. Now, think about this. Anything in creation, because if you really do believe God created everything, and I hope you do, that's what the scripture says, um, then God created the world to function a certain way. And we know this practically. Like, if you, if you try to jump off a cliff, gravity because God created the world a specific way, you're going to fall. Um, and so too, because God created the world a specific way, there are wonderful boundaries that we have to explore our faith, to figure out who we are. And those boundaries are, I would say, limitless because they are who, the very nature of God. And people do better with boundaries. Did you guys know that? Without boundaries, humans don't really know what to do. Um, I remember they did a study about this with elementary kids and they put uh, a group of kids in a, in a park area without boundaries. They were more afraid, more scared. They didn't really know what to do. They were all clumped up in one place. They couldn't really spread their wings and fly, so to speak, and play. But then they put boundaries around and kids started to disperse and have more fun. It, it's how we are hardwired. Um, and so there really is joy. Now, what, what do you guys think the relationship is between homartiology and theology proper based on this quote? So one of you guys tell me, what do you think the relationship is between the two? What's going on here? Quinn? Just study of sin. Yeah, that's what we've been doing the last couple of days. Study of sin. Yeah. So how does it relate to theology proper based on this quote? What do you guys think? What does sin have to do with God's character? How does God's character help? 
goes back to the attributes of God, who he is. And again, spending time considering those of several weeks ago, I just suggested, again, I don't, there's no way for me to test this other than your own personal walk. Are you focusing on who God is? Or are you taking a verse, memorizing it, hiding it in your heart, getting used to who God is, getting to know him better? And as a result, it checks your life. You know, scripture says God is holy. And our, it, that should check our life as we reflect on the holiness of God. Would, would someone who follows you around for a week say, this person's holy? The scripture says God is love. If someone follows you around for a week, would somebody say, this person is loving? So on and so forth. So it checks your actions based on who God is. Okay. Um, the next question I want to ask, don't worry about this stuff here as much. Um, where where does sin come from? Think scripture. Where does sin come from? And I want at least like five responses. That's what the previous classes gave me. What? Okay, so Satan. What else? Where does sin come from? Us. So people. Okay, so Satan. He was the one in the gar there in the garden. But us, we were the ones that tempted. We're tempted and made a mistake. Where else? The very act of temptation. So something, not Satan, not us, something external. So the fruit. Okay. What else? Maybe it's already wrapped up in one. Maybe this is what you're thinking. Was it in the action that Eve took? Was that the sin? Or was it something prior to the action that led her to that sin? There's the action itself, certainly, that was wrong. It's the decision. So Satan shows up. Now, Satan tonight isn't going to show up with an entire army just ready to crush you. Did you know Satan has that? But we're not going to have time to study angelology. But supposedly there is an entire host of demons that are wreaking havoc worldwide. And he could potentially show up and just freak you out. Potentially. But when you read the scripture, that never happens. Why do you think Satan doesn't do that? There's a really practical reason. No, why do you think Satan practically doesn't show up to scare you? That is true. No, there's a really practical answer. Maybe you guys are just too smart for my simple questions. You guys are just thinking so deep. He doesn't want to show up to scare you because then you wouldn't sin. How does Satan show up to throw you off? He puts a thought in your mind. All he did was show up to Eve, and he said, what did he say to Eve? Did God really say? All he did was put a question in her mind. And what, what, what was that ultimately questioning? The very first unit, bibliology. Did God really say? Satan was challenging the very first spoken words of God. And then it gave... Eve freedom to interpret the scripture according to what she wanted. Okay, so it goes to the decision-making process. Be very careful. And this is why Paul, I think, goes out of his way to say, take every thought captive to Christ. Every thought that comes into your brain, just run that through the filter of, Jesus, what do you think about this? What, what's, what should I do about A, B, and C? So on and so forth. So sin, uh, what you should write down, not everything here, just write this word down, autonomy. This is what happens when we start to go our own direction. There's two words here. One is self. Anybody know what the Greek word namos means? <laughs> Daniel Potrath is in here, so we can't really ask that question. Self-law. Okay. This means, now this, this is what's really troubling for your generation, probably more than any other, as the psychologists say. You guys are the most, and I don't, again, I'm not saying this crassly or anything like that, individualistic culture that has ever existed on the face of the earth. Okay? That's something to be concerned about. That's something to unlearn and learn something new. That's something to repent from and say, I don't want to create myself law anymore. This whole idea of YOLO, this whole idea of just 
live your truth. This stuff, to use the King James version of the word, is damning our culture through and through. If you are literally left with, right now we have roughly 8 billion people, you're left with 8 billion people that have to come up with their own self-law. I don't know if you've ever thought about it this way. How gracious are the words of God through the person of Christ to say there is only one way. You don't have to get caught up in trying to figure out and sift through 8 billion different ways of living life. You just look at Christ and say, that is the way. This is the person to follow. Are you tracking with that? Does that make sense? Okay. Um, Now, I want to do a a super brief activity to see how you're processing this according to logic, reason, and my favorite topics, philosophy. So there was this one church father who um, came up with this idea. Um, and so we're going to pick it apart because I don't agree with everything. That this per- oh my gosh. Can you come up here with those? Yeah. Thank you. Um, and, oh, you can, Vanessa, you can join another table if you want, or you can just put your brain to the test, whatever you, whatever you choose. Um, so I have down here pre fall. It shouldn't say man. It should just say pre fall man, post fall man, reborn man, and glorified man. This is obviously before, like it's in the garden before the fall. This is after the fall. And this is when people are in Christ. You're reborn. You are a Christian. And this is in heaven. So according to this paradigm here, I want you to put one of those boxes under each. Okay, So you should just line them up on your table. So read through them. Put them in the correct order, and then I'll walk around and check and see if you guys are on the right track. And two of them are the same, so you don't, just so you're not confusing yourself there. Whoa. That was quick. We got some budding philosophers over here. (laughs) Kaylee's just laughing. <laughs> Don't laugh. Give you another 30 seconds to rearrange, and I'll put the correct answer up on the board here. Like, able to not sit, unable to sin. I know. I have to like figure out what that means. Yeah. It takes so much energy. It does. It's like the brain. You actually exert a lot of calories when you're reading. Yeah. That's why they save. Uh, I remember re- reading this one report. If you study, if you study the muscle group that you're planning on working out that afternoon, and if you think about that specific area in your body as you're working it out, it will not only be a stronger muscle, you'll burn more calories, and it will be a better workout overall. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I remember learning that back at Oregon State. I was blown away. I didn't say that. <laughs> Schwarzenegger. <laughs> Did you say Schwarzenegger or Schwarzenegger? There you go. Okay. Come on, bro. You said Schwarzenegger. No, I didn't. Yeah, you did. I really did. Okay. 
Yeah, yeah, I have it on recording. You're right. Thanks, Vanessa. We'll, we'll check that. Here's the answer. Check your answers. See if uh, see where you're at. Oh yeah. Okay. Now I don't. I guess we were having a conversation about other stuff at the beginning of class. We're running out of time. Um, here's what here. You should write this down now. This is what you should write down. And it seems as if you guys got this for the most part. This is obviously the garden. In the garden, you were, as humanity, able to sin because you had a will, you had a choice, and you're able not to sin. And it's resolved in your desires, what you ultimately want to do. Right? Um, these two would... Um, would be our present experience, even after Genesis 3. You were still in that post-fall. Like, there could be people who don't follow Jesus, obviously. That's a true thing. Even at Westside Christian High School, there are many people who are just actively not following Christ. Um, and so this is what, now this is what perhaps you might want to check and challenge a little bit. This goes back to that one thing that we looked at last week, total depravity. In Augustine's mind, you're, you're essentially totally depraved to do anything right whatsoever apart from Christ. Now, what do you guys think about that? Is that completely true? Based on what I mentioned last week, I don't think that's completely true. I have friends who are atheists and agnostics, and they tend to do decent things a lot of the times, actually. And that's because, to contrast total depravity, we've been created in God's image. And so, of course, it's no shock or surprise when people do good things and they're apart from Christ. Um, there, but why do you think they want to make it so extreme in this in this direction? What do you think they're ultimately trying to communicate? What do you think is going on? If if we weren't full of sin, then there's like the whole Jesus is Savior. What is He ultimately saving? Right, And so they want to make sure that they're balancing the corrupt nature that is involved in us being uh, human. And so the reborn state here simply goes back to the garden. You once again have the ability to choose to follow Christ, to do what is right. And you have the ability to say, I've heard it, I refuse it, intentional, willfully going against it. Right? You can, you can do both and. Now, the glorified sense over here, 100% of the time, your free will, you don't want to put emphasis, it's free still, will be to choose only ever to do that which is right. How is it possible for you to have a free will to only ever choose to do what is right 100% of the time? That's heaven, yeah. It's because, yeah. It's because there's no option to do like the free will. Well, that's a good point. All options, I think, will ultimately be taken away, but we still are free thinkers. We have choice. So how is it possible for us to always choose to do the right thing? It has to do with being part of the new creation. Scripture says you'll have a new body, which means you'll have a new what? Nature. Christ's nature will become your nature. And Christ, it says in the scripture, only ever did things that pleased the Father. Now let's do a quick example of this to prove this point practically. We'll have a holding a breath competition here real quick. It won't take too long because none, no one can hold your breath longer than a minute and a half, I bet. Okay, so let's do it. On three, one, two.
<sighs> no one else was gone? Oh. What? I only made it a minute. Oh, man. Now, ch now check this out. No matter what your choice or will says or dictates in that moment, you're designed right now to have to take a breath. And that's perhaps what the experience in heaven is going to be like. No matter what the choice is, you're going to just naturally, because it's your nature, want to do the right thing because it's fully restored at that point. Does that make sense to you guys? Okay. Um, now, we didn't get to the last thing I wanted to do, which I'm kind of shocked about. There was 10 minutes for the last class. I am going to post instructions for this for you guys. Well, for all the Bible classes they asked me to. You're going to essentially do an art project. Um, and this is a rough draft that I want you to think about and bring back on Tuesday next week. And it could be any medium. So the first thing I want you to write on this piece of paper so you know what to do this weekend is choose art style, whatever art style, not a, not like a poem or like visual art. Yeah, visual, exactly, visual art, not like songs or skits or anything like that. And I want you to choose an art style to, to demonstrate the ideas that we have been communicating. So essentially you're doing an art project for your belief statement. Instead of writing things out, you're going to tell me what you believe based on art. Now, you can't use this as an example now that I'm showing you. This is called Dante's Inferno. He was thinking about the same thing that we're thinking about right now. He came up with levels of different types of stages of hell because they believe that you could actually get out of these um, because this is purgatory. So more instructions on Google Classroom. Check that. You're just simply required to show up with a rough draft sketch of what you want to do. Thank you. You guys have an awesome weekend. We'll see you on Tuesday. You're welcome. Thank you. We'll do.